Holy God, open your word. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that our eyes may be enlightened and we may know the hope to which we have been called. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Our first reading is from Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. In the presence of Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hope. Let your face shine that we may be saved. But let your hand be upon those of your right hand the ones whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Our second reading comes from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is a theologian and an author named Diana Butler Bass who had an article in the Washington Post in 2016 entitled, Forget Red and Green, Make It a Blue Holiday Instead. Now for us this morning, I'm changing that just a little bit to forget purple and pink, make it blue. Because you may have noticed that the Advent candles are blue this year, or maybe you never noticed that they were purple and pink. I don't know. But changing to blue has been a trend within the church for at least the past 15 years. And Bass, in her article, well, she gives one of the best explanations I have ever read as to why the church began making this shift. One year, she says, she was at her local craft store to purchase her Advent candles, and she saw the collection of purple and pink candles. She picked up her three purple candles and her one pink, and she placed them in her basket. And then she saw something, a box of blue candles. Not too light, she says, not too dark, that in-between blue, neither the color of night nor day. She says she looked at the candles in her basket, three penitent purple and one joyful pink, and she put them back. Blue, she said. That's what I feel like this year. Not penitent, 
not joy, just blue. Now, before you start picturing and singing the I'll have a blue Christmas without you kind of blue, I want to invite you into another image. It's a blue that is pretty much named in all the scripture readings for Advent that one can find. Yes, it is a blue, like we hear in the song. It's a blue that holds sadness. It's a blue that kind of holds all those emotions, depression, anxiety, sleeplessness, isolation, stress, that I'm feeling blue and I can't shake it. It does hold all of those emotions that we see and name and that maybe some of us are experiencing this day. These are all realities held in those candles. But this blue, this blue that the church wants to claim, it holds something else right alongside those feelings. You see, what Bass named in her article is that Advent is not a mini Lent. You know, that 40-day season leading up to Easter where purple is a sign of our penitence, of self-denial, a time to examine sins and clear out all the clutter getting in the way of our relationship with God. Advent is not this. Advent is a season of hope, of spiritual preparedness, of awaiting the unexpected, of finding God in unexpected ways, of waiting for light and life to be birthed among us. Advent is hope in the darkness. Bass put it this way in her article, blue candles symbolize the color of the sky right before morning, that time when the deepest dark is just infused with hints of light. Blue holds the promise that the sun will rise and that even after the bleakest, coldest, longest night, the light will break forth as a new day arrives. So blue may be the color of sadness, but it is also the color of hope. Maybe you heard some of this color, some of this sadness and hope, some of this deep darkness infused with hints of light in our readings for today. The psalmist prays for God to enter into the darkness. Give ear, O oh shepherd, they say. Stir up your might. Come to save us. Give us life, they pray. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Enter our darkness, God, with your light. We trust and we hope in you. And then Isaiah well, Isaiah doesn't hold back. God, I want you to show up. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Make your name known. You've done some awesome deeds in the past that we did not expect. Come again. Move among us again. We are all your people. We trust and we hope in you. You know, I think of these passages of Scripture and others like them that we find all throughout the Bible. Anytime there's a tragedy among us, a school shooting, a tragic or untimely death, when we see war, famine, or drought, I think of these passages because what I see so many of my clergy colleagues and people of faith name, especially on social media, are, are some simple words. How long, O oh Lord? How long? This is what the words of the psalmist and the words of Isaiah name. How long? This is what Advent names every year. How long? Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down and fix all of this. Through the season of Advent, we will use the prophetic book of Isaiah in our time of worship together in here each Sunday. And the prophets, 
Well, they all too well understood those words. How long, O Lord? How long? One third of the Hebrew Bible is the voice of the prophets, 17 books in total. And as we continue just to make our way through the Bible this year, we'll talk a little bit more about the voice of the prophet in the book of Isaiah next week. But today, As we heard in Children's Moment, as we are all well into our preparations for Christmas, putting up our trees, setting out the lights, this is what I want us to hear. We believe Isaiah points the way to Jesus. This is why it is our go-to prophetic book during the season of Advent and Christmas. And Jesus, well, Jesus is the hope, we believe, that came into our lives and wants to light our darkness each day. Light and life to all he brings. So think back to that color blue representing sadness and hope. And think about when we celebrate this season. I mean, for us, the Advent season contains the longest night of the year. The holidays for many can be a time of deep sadness and loneliness. But what we will do each Sunday, we'll gather in this space. We will, as Bass says, light a candle and we will name that even when the darkness surrounds, even when all seems lost, even as we proclaim, how long, O Lord, how long, light breaks through the night. We will light a candle against the night trusting and believing that there is a greater light that will arise because what we are waiting for, what we long for, well, it's not a Christmas morning to open presents or to gather around a table with family. We are waiting for light and life to be birthed among us. For, as Bass says, God to renew and heal the world. A promise that we understand to have been mysteriously embodied in a baby born in a manger. Advent names this waiting. It acknowledges the longing, it claims the blue, but Advent also says we need not fear the dark. We cannot rush the night. It will take as long as it will take, but we can As Bass says, light some candles, sing some songs, gather together and say some prayers. But the voice of the prophet is saying to the people of Israel and to us is that the long night of anguish is coming to an end. And this is how we begin our Advent journey, our Christmas preparation. We name the waiting. We name the longing. We light a candle, and we name the hope. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine in our darkness that we and all of your creation might be saved. And one more thing today as we begin this journey. We come to table to receive. We come together as one body, and we receive grace. For Christmas comes, but not yet. Before we celebrate, let us wait, taking time to remember who is coming, time to prepare our lives, time to look outwards in love, because Christmas waits to come. We are to gently count the days, to find time to wait and walk with God. May it be so. Amen.